Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, imagine, Mr. Xi, of course, Dr. Xi, imagine our own, own dear city of Utrecht as a pivot of international politics. Our own city as the place to be for diplomats from all over the continent. Our city as the place where decisions were taken about the world's future, about the balance between the great political powers of the world in those days still limited to our continent, Europe. Decisions about spheres of influence, about the protection of borders, about the command of seas and colonies, about succession and slave trade, about the rise and fall of nations. Imagine our own beautiful city of Utrecht as the center of the world after more than 10 years, some say more than 50 years of wars of all against all. Expensive, exhaustive and infectious wars, whether with regard to money, administration or human lives. And without any international body, neither United Nations nor European community or NATO, nor even a Dutch Society of International Affairs to structure eventual peace initiatives and to guide and support the rebalancing of power relations. And imagine, this tremendous diplomatic circus happened in and happened to Utrecht in those days, a rather backward provincial town with around, with around 1713, because that's the year I'm talking about, about 25,000 inhabitants. During a period of 15 months, it was Utrecht that held the diplomatic spotlights like later on in history, Yalta, Potsdam, Oslo, and Camp David did. 15 months, because each of the many participating nations had to negotiate for its own treaties with all others. And of course, everything is connected with everything and permanent consultation was required. Finally, the grandson of the Bourbon King of France was allowed to ascend the Spanish throne. But France lost a lot of territory to Canada and Spain was a nation on the way down. The Habsburg family ruling Austria, of course, lost their power in Spain, but gained large parts of Italy and what is now known as Belgium. Great victor was England, with Gibraltar and the Isle of Menorca gaining control over the Mediterranean and also acquired the monopoly of slave trade in Latin America. Quite apart from being done with, this, with its greatest enemy, the Dutch Republic, which was, despite housing the negotiations, the main loser of the peace of Utrecht. We lost our command of the seas, the only real gain being the incorporation of the city of Venlo and surrounding areas. Venlo, the city of Geert Wilders. Ladies and gentlemen, why do, you, why do I tell you this? First, because this story shows the differences between our handling and control of war and peace of which the Balkans and Afghanistan are good, sometimes sad examples, and the circumstances of 300 years ago. Second, the Treaty of Utrecht, or rather Treaties of Utrecht, will be festively commemorated next year, because 2013 they were signed 300 years ago. And finally, to be more exact, the round table behind which the negotiations took place was to be found in the predecessor of this very building. 
So for me, as a mayor of Utrecht, it is very appropriate to host the Dutch Society of International Affairs here in our town hall. Dipl diplomatically spoken, this is historical ground, where I welcome you heartily in our currently breezing, internationally orientated and open-minded city of knowledge and culture, firmly nourishing the ambitions to become cultural capital of Europe in 2018, expecting that Dr. Scheer's lecture will be as arresting and instructive as one might expect from a man of his statute and experience. I can safely wish you a very pleasant evening here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We appreciate that at some point duty calls, and we'll leave it up to you because I know you have responsibilities elsewhere in this building, but we're very glad that you can stay at least for some time. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as mentioned earlier, we were expecting Director Brom Boxhorn to introduce our speaker. Now, unfortunately, Dr. Boxhorn fell ill, and so I'm the designated volunteer to take over this special task. We all wish the director well and regret that he cannot be here with us tonight. Likewise, we wish also Danish Ambassador Raymond Nielsen a speedy recovery, whom also at the last moment encountered medical force majeure. However, our focus will now have to shift towards our speaker of tonight. What is there to tell about Mr. Jamie Patrick Shea? As the NATO website mentions, he is born on the 11th of September 1953 in London. And of course, our speaker is indeed world famous for his Cockney accent, even though he has a PhD from Oxford University. While this perhaps regards no contradiction in terms, it is certainly unusual. That word, unusual, very well describes Dr. Shea. Already back in the 1980s, when Dr. Shea started at NATO, his unusual energy, enthusiasm, as well as his dedication and devotion for lifting NATO to a higher level, soon became apparent and evident. For a then still rather young upstart like me, it was very refreshing to find so much common ground with the NATO official responsible for conferences and seminars, also outside the NATO premises, while our speaker has always kept NATO promises to support youth and other programs all over the European continent. I'm still very grateful for that. And as you know, Jamie, many of the young people whom we could mutually support in the past have by now become minister, ambassador, uh, NGO director, editor-in-chief of leading newspapers, very gratifying indeed, and you have never ceased to approach with equal respect these representatives of the new generation, as well as the makers, shakers, and breakers of official policies. That is rather remarkable and very unusual. But then again, we know that you are indeed unusual in the most positive sense. Ladies and gentlemen, many of you are aware that in this day and age, NATO has an outstanding public relations and public diplomacy policy, to which Dr. Shea has contributed to a very large extent. Under unique circumstances, following Operation Allied Force, when Dr. Shea was the spokesman of NATO and deputy director, later director of information and press, Jamie Shea demonstrated unusual resilience and skill in convincing the general public that there is merit in having a NATO alliance. Furthermore, Dr. Shea explained to NATO officials and the general public that the alliance has to reach out, in particular to countries and nations not yet part and parcel of, U of the Euro-Atlantic structures. Personally, I have very fond memories of Dr. Shea and NATO's outreach program, which brought people from Central, Eastern and Southeastern Europe together in northern countries like Denmark or the Netherlands, but also you, Jamie, and NATO at large supported many programs in the Balkans. Extensive mutual trust and understanding emerged from all these programs. In your later capacity, here it comes, as Deputy Assistant Secretary General for External Relations at the Public Diplomacy Division, you extended and expanded not only your business card, but also your realm of responsibility in making NATO an attractive organization. Nowadays, you do so as the Deputy Assistant Secretary General for Emerging Security Challenges. I don't know who 
at NATO decides on these long titles, but I do know that NATO is much entitled to Dr. James Shea for his decades of speech writing, policy initiating, as well as policy planning plus policy implementation. In the process, Jamie, you've become a role model when it comes to factual knowledge and practical skills as the combined PhD doctor and the spin doctor. Who never has a prepared text, but always arrives prepared. And as a NATO man who is always ready, willing and able for whatever the alliance is heading towards and wherever NATO tells you to go to, also to places like Utrecht. It is thus a privilege and a pleasure to invite you, Jamie, to tell us all about NATO and the Balkans in Afghanistan and to reveal to us what emerging challenges lie ahead of us. Therefore, without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Shea, Dr. Shea to claim the rostrum and Dr. Segers to be seated at the chairman's table. Gentlemen, the audience is ready for you. I trust that you are ready for them. Thank you.